Hello, people. It's me, Natalie, from Creative Makers. We're a little bit late starting, sorry. Uh, we were having a conversation and it was quite lovely and it was hard to break away. Honestly, I could have kept going. I am sitting here today with Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. This is Mark Strickland. Hi. And Mark Hi. Strickland is a major artist in my point of view and I think in others as well. Um, Mark has museum shows. Mark was an instructor at the Art Center um, College of Design in Pasadena, which is a big deal school. Mark is also a musician, which he will tell you is very on a low level, but it's still part of him. There's incredible stuff here to learn with Mark. So we're going to talk to him and get into it. <laughs> okay. Ready? <I'm> ready. <laughs> All right. Um, if nobody's here yet, but they will tell us when they are here, it'll show. Um, so the first question I always ask people yeah, is yeah. tell me about your creative life when you were a kid. How did that show up for you? Um, my, my dad, uh, had, was, had been a, a, a Disney animator actually. And then he gave up the, the art life some years later to be an inventor. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that part. Yeah, yeah. And so he, he worked on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, he, the cleaning scene, and he worked on, on, um, on uh, Fantasia, the dancing with the, with the uh, what are they, crocodiles or something like that? I don't know. Whatever they yeah. are. <laughs> yeah, anyway. But, he, but when, I was, uh, when I was little, he had, um, he had a, a studio right next to my bedroom and he would be painting a, a nude model in, uh, in there. And, and I, I remember asking, uh, uh, how do you make, and I remember the model name was uh, uh, Virginia, how do you make her without her clothes on? And I was only five. And, and he said, uh, I use my imagination. Oh, but I got so she really, was she was clothed. No, nude. Oh, she was nude. Oh, okay. With a big hat on, oh, okay. and so I peeked through the, I peeked through the keyhole, and I saw my mom sitting there, like with her hands folded, and and Virginia with her hat on, or something like that. Your and mom was monitoring the situation. A little bit, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but then, um, and it sounds a little bit carnal, but. But she would, my mom was really conservative and she'd have a little tea party down below with her friends. And, and for something to do, I would be drawing on some meat, meat paper and, you know, that was laid out on the floor because you can get big, huge big big, rolls. Big rolls of it. And I, and I was doing what I remembered of Virginia with breasts and everything like that. And then I remember getting frustrated. I was five. And I remember she was, I think she was embarrassed. She's mortified probably. Mortified oh with her God. friends having tea. And my five-year-old son is doing um, nude, nude drawings right now. Uh, oh, well, there it is. <laughs> oh my God. That, that must have, she might have been, I wonder if she ever thought about that again, whether she was maybe a little bit proud. Um, that could be. But I remember, I remember uh, I was getting frustrated because I couldn't get the breasts right. And so, and, and she goes, and she saw me kind of like growling and, and she got up from her tea party and said, can I help you? And I dove on top of the drawing and I'm like, no, I can do it myself. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so, I mean, your first, I mean, every kid's first interest is drawing, Yeah. but you took it further. Uh, I did. I always drew, I always drew through uh, elementary school and, uh, and I remember, I remember I was in fourth grade and they asked me to do a, uh, a bear. And I remember I did, a, did a, like a six foot tall bear and it looked like a bear and I painted it in. Everybody, everybody has those experiences. Yeah. Though. It's not special. But you were that kid. You were like the artist kid when somebody wanted something done. Mark, will you draw me a fish or whatever? Yeah. Right? And, and also uh, my dad, uh, my dad came to our, we were living in Bashan Island in Washington State, and, uh, and they, 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 the kids were really thrilled that, that my dad had, was a Disney animator. So he came and, and showed them how to draw Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And he showed me to make a circle and then up for the beak or something, and then a, kind of an S and so forth for mm -hmm. the beak of Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse. And so the, I was in fourth grade and, and, or fifth grade, and they sent me all through the school after, after that, giving lessons 
on the board to the sixth graders and 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 the and, and the end of the school. So I, it actually was it was as if I were teaching. I was going to say, there's your early teaching career I right know, there. Isn't that weird? No, not weird <laughs> at all. Actually. Yeah, but it, it was easy to do. You know what I mean? You just make a circle. Yeah. And and you know, the, the, by the way, I think it's kind of cute because my I have a son who is twenty six, and I was and I was teaching animation in his second grade class or something like that. And I was talking about doing circles. It's kind of like wax on, wax off, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, what, what was that? What was that? Uh, karate kid. Karate kid, exactly. And I was, and I was point, saying when you're drawing a circle, if your hand is in the wrong position or your arm, you, you, you have to be, you have to get out of your own way. And I remember, <laughs> I remember after the whole thing was over, I said, and if we learn anything, Anything here? There's like 26 kids in the class. I'm going. That when you're when you're doing animation and you're doing circles, you have to get out of your own. And all 26 kids go way at the same time. But I bet that's a, a thing that they've never forgotten as they've Maybe gotten not. older. You know, they're like, remember that crazy guy that came in yeah, and told I, us I, I that know, did like, the wax on, <laughs> wax off, and then yeah. get out of my own way. You, yeah. know, you never know how that stuff sort of yeah. sticks. Yeah, yeah. Um. So okay, so. Your kid, you you're drawing. At this point, are you are you thinking that maybe you'd like to do something in art? I know that you had some conflict with your parents. My I think my dad um, my dad, it's interestingly, because he had switched from being an artist, and uh, that I remember that he that he wanted me to go into psychology. So I ended up going into psychology. Now, did you have any interest in psychology? No, not really. And no. then when I finally, when I finally finished it, um, I go, I don't want to be a psychologist. But I, but I, but what I, the reason I think that my interest in psychology was because I was interested in hu human nature. Right. And I think, I think from early on in my life, I was a little bit of a, a natural. Humanist, mm -hmm. and so so I felt like well, what I wanted out of psychology was to understand the duality of people, why they act the way they do, but then I would like to be able to uh, to be, I want to be an artist, and I've and, and I've been repressing that and holding that back, and so so when I so right from the get go when I started doing art, I was I was I was really talking about the human condition. So when you were in school and you were doing your psychology degree, were you practicing art the, the whole time? Or what, what, yeah, were you yeah, really I, repressing it completely? Oh, no, no, no. I was always drawing really weird things out of my head. I mean, I was always drawing things out of my own head that looked weird, you know. I mean, crazy. I wonder if you were trying to draw out your conflict. Um, y yeah, I mean... Uh, uh, I, I mean, I had I had weird dreams, and I would draw the dreams the next mm -hmm. day. You know, I mean, there's something to that too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay, so you finish your psychology degree, and you're like, nope, this this isn't it. No, I and didn't want to. I didn't want a bunch of. I didn't. I didn't want to devote myself yeah. to that. Yeah. And your dad wasn't happy. He said very specifically, uh, because I had to go through all of my art training with no financial help from my family family. Uh, he said, you're not going to be a financial liability on this family if you want to go go into art. So good luck. So it's, it's such an interesting stance since he too was an artist. I mean, obviously he knew the difficulties in, in making a living from practicing, oh, yeah. you know, was art. He, yeah. But by the same token, I mean, he was in it himself. I mean, to repress such things in yourself you know the probably in a way we didn't in, in a way we kind of I had to do what I, do that on my own without any approval and 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 it probably 20 years later he walked into my space where I was working and he paid me the highest compliment that you you dream your father would want to tell you he said you know he, he said if I'd known you when I quit being an artist I think I never would have quit being an artist. So he had his own regrets. 
about that, it seems. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but he's very, very talented and extremely, extremely talented. And, and one thing I notice, and I, I'm almost thinking of it right now, that when he was doing business and he was successful and other things like that, I never saw him as happy mm. as I remember when he was when he was doing his art when I was younger. That makes me so sad to know that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That I mean, somehow he thought he had to had to um, do this different role yeah. and not have this other piece of him available. Yeah. You know, I wrote a poem. I I like. I wonder where it, I, where it is, but but it's called "I'm Crying for the Poets Who Never Were." And and it's and it, I would say in my teaching, uh, I spent the entirety of my teaching almost teaching non drawers to draw. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and it's exactly that. So I'm I'm an art proselytizer. I'm guilty. Yeah. If that's if that's if you know if that's what it it, it feels like to be wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> What's that dumb it. song? Like a high five. <laughs> um. So. So how did you, okay, so you started, how, how did you make that transition? What happened? I mean, did you actually, I know that you went to school then to be an artist, right? You act, did you actually? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. I went back and I, I, I paid my own way and I went to Art Center College of Design and I was and and taking classes and so forth. And, uh, and but my, my background and my degree was from, in psychology. But no art degree. No, no, no. <laughs> but no art degree. Yeah, so yeah. okay. So how did you transition then? I mean, how? I mean, where was it? Were you just making work, and suddenly people were like, "I think I'd like to buy this from you," or were, were people seeing what you were doing and you were getting commissions? Were you doing high level projects, and that's how you? Were, I mean, how how did you make that switch? Because at some point. You know, you're one thing, and then you have to become the other. I know it's not quite uh, well, that black and white. Well, you know, we were t when you came over uh, with Dave yesterday, um, and we were. I, I think I was telling you this story, which is, I haven't told too many people, but but I actually thought I wanted to be a musician, and 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 because I was b better at it, my grandparents had a, a a band, a country band, you know, and that I grew up with from childhood, and. And so, and, uh, and I still, uh, and so I, I'd been playing since I was little. So I wasn't a very good artist, but I, but I was a fairly okay musician. And, 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 and I think I would mention to you and Dave yesterday that I had this pizza, pizza, pizza jar with brushes in it. And, uh, and my guitar was sitting over here and I didn't like the, the, the music teacher too much and, because he wasn't paying any attention. And at one moment, something miraculous and insane happened when I was sitting. I'm not a good artist, but and I want to be a musician. And right at one moment, I'm when I'm going between my, I will go into art or I'll go into music, art or music. All of a sudden, at that moment, and this sounds like crazy talk, but that that jar lifted it and threw itself six feet, five feet across the room and. And scratch my guitar like a jealous lover. It sounds crazy, but it, yeah, I and I, I wasn't on drugs. I wasn't doing it. I love this story so much. I I cannot tell you. Um, we talked about this yesterday. That that was magical. Yeah. In that moment, but yeah. what you didn't share with me, even though I asked, is what do you think it meant? Oh, it I, it, it meant it meant go into art, and and I was sharing with you also. I could do. I could only do art a few hours a day, but I mean music a, a couple hours hours a day, practicing without getting bored. But then, but I could sit and do the art with my nose on the bed, and I could just do it all day, even though I wasn't very good at it. It was just that I was, it was just like I I love the meditative quality of of being able to go into that interiorized that space of being an artist, which somehow I I. I could, I seem, somehow I could do better even though I wasn't very good at it, you know. I, I, I think there might be a little judgment on your part right there, but that's okay. I'm just going to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, okay, so, but still, how, how did you make the transition into making some money with art? 
Because um, I mean, basically, this is all you did, right? Yeah. This was your this was your livelihood. Well, what I what I did is is that I, um, well, when I I was in graduate school in psychology, I wanted to work with mentally challenged people at Cal State Long Beach, and uh, and 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 the 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 war. I mean, people were getting drafted, and my number was so high. When the when the lottery came out, I think I was, it was I was three hundred and thirty six, and they only took people out of three hundred sixty five days, up to one hundred and twenty six or something. So I did the stupidest thing: is is that I, I I left my psychology masters by slam dunking my books and going and, and walking off. And and if those teachers had not um, all given me a, a legal W and not a WF withdrawal failure. I never would have had a career. But later I came back um, thinking, and I noticed that they had a degree at Long Beach State that was really weird, that, that it was in, uh, it was uh, um, bi bi biological illustration or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and, so, and I was going to try something like that. But then I was thinking, maybe I could, maybe I could do, tr do something like psychology double major so i was so i was in a, a i asked the people from the clinical psychology people if they would go for that and the people from the art department if they would go for that if we and and they said well if you get decent grades in both then we'll propose it to the dean and they did and so i ended up getting a art as an influence psychology as an influence on art was the name of the thesis and i went into long beach city jail and I was doing drawing prisoners because one of the guys in the in the clinical psychology class ran the confiscation room and he'd taken us through a tour there. So and I did homeless people and I and that 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 thrilled me. That thrilled me. Right, because I mean a lot of your work and all of his work is available online. There's interviews that you can actually um, yeah. go online and listen to, and it's just fascinating. But your work, I mean, as you were taking me through it yesterday. Uh, and as you've said yourself, all has to do with the human condition. Now, when you went into the jails and you were starting to paint the guys that were actually in jail and stuff, I mean, people have to sit there and pose. Were they having conversations with you? I mean, because I would find, I would think that this would be a place where it almost becomes like a confessional of sorts. Actually, actually, the way that went down is, is that after the this uh, colleague from my 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 clinical psychology class after he took the whole class through the confiscation room mm -hmm. and there were guns like with, with tags on it like dirty hairy 44s and you'd kick and it's been around bags of cocaine everything that you could think oh of God. and that the, the trustees he wouldn't just let me easily come in there because the trustees had had all got sent up the river for a big because they used their tools to take something like a manhole cover off the top of the confiscation room, they would drop down there, get the drugs, smoke a cigarette, and throw the drugs over the fence, and they were making big, a big score, big money. Yeah. So when I said, "Can I come up and draw the, draw the trustees?" he goes, he goes, "There are no more trustees," you know, and and so, and asked the sergeant at Ar sergeant at arms, and the sergeant at arms was completely rude, said, "Write the governor," and so I, I told him. I can't afford another semester. I have no money, you know, and 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 I've got only two weeks before I have to have the whole th thesis done for both departments. I said, please let me come up and draw. I said, well, okay, if you're not afraid, we'll call new people up that are, have not been checked out to be trustees to be. So he asked me. So we went to in in that on that same floor is the homicides homicide division which hadn't been for 20 years in uh, holding prisoners. It was his office, mm -hmm. basically. So he called two guys up and, and he had them holding the bars of the prison uh, and on the, on the bunks there's a stainless steel toilet. And, and I was frankly afraid to be in, locked in there with him because the gates, the doors were open, closed, open, closed, and they all slid, right. closed, clink like that. But I couldn't see, and, I, and after, to your point, after talking with uh, the Mexican fellow uh, on the bottom bench, he, he seemed very nice and he said, how do you want me to pose, man? You know, and I go, and he's holding the bars behind the bunk bed and I go, 
mm, that looks good, you know, <laughs> good pose. Yeah. And so I came, I went and told the, like my schoolmate, I mean, who uh, was head of the confiscation room, I said, you know what, I can't see there's light coming in the window. Can you go, I'll, I'll go inside. So there's a stainless steel toilet and two bunks. And, uh, and, and, I, and he gave me a chair and I sit there and I drew the, drew the fellow. And, uh, so there was only one guy? In there. No, there were two, but I only drew the one. Wow. And when I finished it, he goes, I sh he, goes, he goes, let me see, you know. And it was a croquo pen dipped in ink. It wasn't a painting, it was just a drawing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he goes, hey, that's pretty good. He says, why don't you put this writing on the wall? Because it says Elias 1956 and from the homicide division, you know. I was all scratched into the wall. So uh -huh. I go, thank you, that was a good idea. I'll do that, you know. So that must have been sort of enlightening for you in that moment. Thrilling, thrilling. I mean, you you talk about being scared. How did I mean just just realizing that they were just people that just helped you get over the hump and you were just like no I just after I talked to them for for a minute I didn't mind being you know I mean I didn't want somebody to come up with something on my neck you know what I mean and try to you know it could I, have, I, I mean know, it could have gotten pretty hairy especially with two people in that bunk yeah, and you yeah yeah you know so I mean I, I my trust I I really I know people pretty well you know. And, and I trust my ability to recognize that these guys are safe and they're good. I've worked with gang members since then and everything like that. And so, I, and, and probably I've never seen anybody more needing of a dad and, and loving than gang members. I mean, and, uh, and so sweet and so respectful. I even did an exhibition in a, in a, in a school just for gang members. Nobody, nobody ta tagged the paintings. They were, they were really respectful and loving. I think that is an excellent point, though. I mean, these, these guys are looking for attention. They and need, to have they, attention and, and from a lot male. Of them, they, they need a dad. I mean, yeah. a, lot, a lot of them. I mean, yeah. and to have you pay attention and then want to draw them because you see something valuable in them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. th talk about the psychological aspect here. Yeah, yeah. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And I think one of the coolest exchanges that I had was, was in, in talking about... Putting, putting your emotion into art, that I'm sitting, sitting there saying, saying, you know what? Um, if you have some spoiled person who's, you know, like get, getting all the toys they want thing and sitting in their back of their parents' Lexus or whatever, up in the valley or whatever, and and they don't, they don't, they get everything they want. They don't really have anything to say because they don't really have any conflict. You have conflict. You have something to say. You're, you have so much better chance of being a good artist. And, and, and when you think about it, all the negative things that happen to you and then the abuse on all sorts of level that happen to you is so good for art if, you, if it's what you do with it. So, so even feeling anger, even feeling violence in a way, if you, if you put it into your painting, you know, that it's what you do with it that makes it right or wrong. But if you didn't have anger, from all of that stuff that was dumped on you, and you, then you wouldn't have a fuse. You'd probably your brain would explode, and so so you, so it's really you you're, you don't realize how not only healthy you are, but how much you have to express because of it. I always talk about anger being a catalyst. It's okay. such a catalyst of energy. I mean, oh, it, it yeah. just depends on which direction you want to send it. You know. Oh yeah. Um, how long did you work with gang members? people in prison, I mean, like seeing these people physically and drawing from them? Um, I, I uh, well, during the whole master's degree, I, I, I would end up uh, find, finding uh, people on the street. Actually, even when I started teaching at Art Center, I, I, I didn't want to lose that connection to, to the, the, the realness of it. Mm -hmm. And so I remember driving my old Volvo down on a street in Hollywood or something, and I saw a very handsome, um, I think Bostonian um, man in a pea coat, homeless, long gray hair, but very elegant, pushing a, a, a wagon. And I didn't want to tell him I was a teacher. I told him I was a, a student, but I stopped my car and I said, and I said, you know, I would, I would, I'm a student of art, and I would, I just, I just looking at you and and the way you, you walk and the way you feel and everything. Could could we make some kind of arrangement that I could, I could we could work together and you I could, you know, 
pay you something and we, you, I could paint you or things like that. And we did, and, and we would, we'd meet in the park and, and I, I'd bring him sandwich and pipe tobacco and everything. And I even brought him up to Art Center to, uh, to model. To have him sit for your class. For, yeah, and the model secretary, who had been a, at that time, the earlier one before Nancy Lilly, had actually been a bullfighter, the woman. And she loved that I was bringing up a model, and he got actually props and costume, extra pay from being nude, just nude. And, uh, and I put his, uh, in, back in my old Volvo, I put his, his um, uh, shopping cart in the back of the trunk and, to carry with me up there. On the way there, his name was Frank Charles Perkins. And, and while I'm driving to Art Center from, Ho Art Center's in Pasadena, yeah. from Hollywood, I go, I'm driving and I go, and he's smoking his pipe, really like a Kennedy, like a gentleman, and, and, and beautiful accent. And I go, I go, Frank, I said, um, I said, if, if, you were, if, if you were reincarnated into an animal, what kind of animal would you be? So I used to ask trippy questions like that. <laughs> and uh, and he, I think the guy that was tripping out because he's smoking like for five minutes and, and, all, and I'm thinking, well, I guess he missed the question. And then all of a sudden, I, out of nowhere, I'm driving and he goes, a donkey, a donkey, Mark. And I go, what? And he goes, I believe I'd be a donkey. And I'm going, and I remember it, I'd ask the question, I go, why would you be a donkey, Frank? And, he, and, and then he smokes his pipe and goes, another couple of minutes, he goes, then he, then he goes, because a donkey is the kindest and most mistreated animal in the world. What a sweet, thoughtful answer. Yeah, and the students loved him. And I told them, and, and I got the best drawings out of them, because I told them my, the secret because I didn't, I, I didn't have that. I was kind of self-trained more or less. And that, and that when I would draw Frank Charles Perkins, that it wasn't about me or my drawing being good. I had so much um, compassion that he was living homeless and that, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm in his life and I'm, we're talking and we're friends and I'm, bringing him sandwich and pipe tobacco and we're talking as, as equals as friends and, and, and I'm looking up to him in a, in a way of he had a kind of a nobility that I could actually look up to. And, and, and I told the students that it made my drawing better because I could leave my ego because it wasn't about me. Right. And so, so you start looking at, you got a million hairs and the guy hasn't been able to, to shower and they're kind of stuck together a little bit, but you're feeling his soul a little bit, if you really take the time. And then what I notice is, and that I would tell them, is, is that you, you may, when I was drawing the homeless in the, in the MacArthur Park, they would get up and walk away, so sometime I only had one or two minutes or three minutes. So when I would draw the hair, I had to be really selective. And the hair that I would choose would be the line that, that stuck together that, that represented mostly what that feeling of his vibration was. I, it's almost like you have to step into his body to be him exactly. for a moment. Well, I, I understand this yeah. feeling personally speaking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I think about, you know, who, I don't know who you are at all. Yeah. But I need to know who you are in yeah. order to get you across on yeah. this painting. Not because, oh, yeah. it, it, exactly, it has nothing to do with who I am. Yeah, it yeah. has everything to do with who you are. And so I have to be you for a couple of minutes yeah, or yeah. however long. Uh, yeah. It's really, yeah. Well, in MacArthur Park, there were these, uh, there were these uh, Russians that had been, um, that had all uh, been uh, in, in the, uh, revolutionaries in the war that had killed many, many people. I had no idea, but I found them really great looking characters. And then I, I remember there was one fellow and, and, and he would, he'd, he'd, he'd look like, watch people go by. I did him in profile. <laughs> and I, 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 he'd watch people go by and I'd wait till his, his nose was like in profile and then I would draw him and then I'd wait and wait and wait until he would watch him and then he'd get into that position and I'd finish it. So this other man came up to me and he, and he goes, he goes, do you know who he is, you know? And, and I'm going, uh, no, sir, I don't. And he was another homeless guy. He, he goes, 
I don't know him, but I know of him. He's a very famous revolutionary and he killed many, many people. And, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there getting like, like oops. <laughs> the guy sees us talking about him. He walks up and, and, and he, says, he says, what are you doing? You know, and, and, and the guy with joy, he says, he's doing a drawing of you in profile. <laughs> and he goes, let me see, you know? Yeah. And I'm getting scared. This guy killed a lot of people. Yeah, you know? you're, you're yeah, dead. Yeah, yeah, I'm dead, you know? <laughs> and I didn't give him a very complimentary profile, you know, with a big nose. And I, and I, and I said, what if I just... If that's the way he looked. That's the hey. way he looked, you know? <laughs> and so finally he looked at the drawing and he goes, he, he goes, um, he says... Uh, uh, he, he says, uh, that don't look like me. And, and, the, and the, the guy says, of course it looks like you. Didn't you ever see yourself in profile? <laughs> <laughs> and then the guy, then he says, you wouldn't by chance want to give me that drawing. You know, the, the revolutionary yeah. guy said. And, he, he, and, he's, and the, my, now the other one goes, of course he can't give you the drawing. He said, you should be honored. You have been immortalized in art. Isn't this the sweetest thing? They're having this whole conversation. You're just sitting there and they're answering back and forth. Yeah, and yeah, but I don't think I'm going to be dead. <laughs> God, this is, I mean, these are the, these are the stories. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going back again. So after you, so did you go straight to Art Center and get a job immediately after this? Wow, yeah. Is this what happened? What, actually, what happened? Because I wasn't getting any family support. Right. So, and then I you already had, I had a kid and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, um, and so I'm working at $7 an hour as a typist clerk for three and a half years at UCLA Emergency Room. The 3 to 11 shift. Wow, okay. And the 3 to 11 shift allowed me to be at 9 o'clock in the morning at Long Beach State. You know, taking right. taking the classes and painting and drawing and blah 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 and right. doing all this kind of stuff. And so you were just getting by. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, and and I was also drawing people. Uh, Sometimes I would do the night shift, and I would I I, I drew people um, that were in the gurneys. Sometimes I would be drawing somebody in the gurney in the dark. And, the, and one time the guy went flatline, which looked like I killed him, you know what I mean? Because I'm in the dark with him drawing. And so, so I, I, I hit the emergency button, I, I run out, you know, I, I didn't do it, you know what I mean? But they're, they're pumping on it, you know, so, but it was, it was an adventure. So you had, so you had this job on, on the side that was basically keeping you alive while you were doing Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, going back. So you went to Art Center, you just flipped over and just called Art Center oh, one day? Okay, okay. What Here, happened? Okay, so there was a fellow named Foster who was my boss in the, as a typist clerk. Yeah. I ended up going to medical school. And, um, and, he, uh, I, uh, and he had got, he, he showed me that there was a program for people who had graduated from UCLA that they could get, uh, they could get internships at different junior colleges. So I go, cool, I graduated from UCLA in, in psychology. So I went to Santa Monica College and, and, I, and, I found, and, I, and I found and I applied for an internship. Well, I was lucky because the department chairman, I forget his name, uh, invited me to co-teach advanced head painting at Santa Monica College as an intern. And, and so, um, so what I did is I went up to and then I went up to, I went, and then they hired me actually to teach at Santa Monica College. Uh, and then what happened is Proposition 13 came out mm -hmm. and I lost the job. And my name was, was in the catalog already oh. because they weren't hiring new people. So I quit my job at, 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 you know, thinking I was pretty hot stuff and I quit my job in the emergency room. And, uh, and I had to come back crawling on my hands and knees and asking it. And they were so mad at me that they gave me the, the, uh, uh, the 11 to seven shift as punishment, even though my, my space was still open. And so, um, so just took a chance and I went up and I took 
the, I showed you a painting of my grandmother that, yes. and her peeling potatoes in her backyard with her nighty on their four foot painting and I brought it up to Art Center and it was just like I mean in life sometimes you just fall fall into it yeah, luck good and so I went up there and I showed the drawings of the prisoners and I also it said that I had a recommendation from the department chair that I was teaching at Santa Monica College. They didn't say that I was teaching. I, I, didn't, didn't, I didn't need to explain that it was an internship and it was a program. Right. And a, but they just knew I'd had some teaching experience. They hired me full time because a guy walked out uh, uh, who was teaching a course called Drawing for Illustration. And he just disappeared. And they need somebody to fill his shoes. So they hired me full time in 1978. Isn't it interesting, though, because if you had been working at Santa Monica College, you never would have gone seeking this other job. No, that's true. You never, you never would have been there. Yeah, and I'll tell you a cute story. I was pretty young, and, and so I, my first class at Art Center was, was a night class, and, and, I, um, <clears throat> and I, I come into the class, and everybody in the class... Oh, hold on. Georgia's saying that we're frozen. Are we still frozen, Georgia? Making me wonder what's going on. Well, I don't know. How much did we lose? I don't, I don't know, but there's people. Oh, there's questions. Oh, somebody says you look like Bo Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> um, psychology and art go very well together. That's Georgia. Georgia's an incredible artist. Uh, I'm hoping. Oh, no, we're not frozen anymore. Thank you, Georgia. Okay, good. Sorry. Cute story. Keep going. Um, oh yeah, yeah, my first, my first class teaching at Art Center. I go in there and everybody's older than I am and the class is filled. That teacher had walked out and everybody was growling and complaining. It was a seven to 10 class and they're, they're so angry and we're paying all this money and that they hired some no young kid, you know what I mean, to teach and we paid the money for this other guy and blah, blah, blah. It was seven o'clock, class was supposed to begin. I was frozen. I was so scared to admit that I was the teacher. And all I, I just could, I was frozen there and I hear him getting angrier and angrier. And now the teacher's late and it's 7.15. Oh my God, you didn't, you were I just couldn't, I there. was too scared. And I, and here are my words. I got up on the, on the plat, model stage, you know, on the platform. And, and they're all talking so loud and angry and blah, blah, blah. And I go, <clears throat> excuse me. And they didn't listen to me. And I go, excuse me, you know. <laughs> and finally, I, I always, class, excuse me, you know. And please, can, can, can you please stop talking for a second? I go, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm your teacher. <laughs> I took those exact words. I'm sorry to tell you. I'm the teacher. Did they all take their stuff and throw it up in the air? No. <laughs> no, but I, I, it was... I'm sure you won was, them over pretty quickly. It, it, it was great from the very beginning. It was thrilling. In fact, I believe I was a better teacher in... I taught 34 years. I think I was a better teacher in the first 10 or 15 years than I was later because I was not a very sophisticated artist and I was teaching what how I taught myself and it was really authentic and everything. Later I was coming back and I was probably teaching things that, that were more sophisticated rendering and things like that that I needed to know. You know, and a great saying is teacher teaches best what they need most to learn themselves. You know, that's a great saying. So the whole time that you're teaching at Art Center, obviously you're working on your own stuff oh, yeah. behind the scenes, right? right you can't right. stop that. Right, right. And were you, you were still investigating the human condition, you were still exploring that sort of <clears throat> Yes, idea. yes, and I, I also, I, um, I also had brought Frank Charles Perkins to the, to the class, mm -hmm. and I tried to get them the experience of what, what how I learned to, to let go of my ego, to be able to feel the person and, mm -hmm. and express, you know, whatever I saw. And, um, but... One day I fell into kind of a depression because mm -hmm. I, the painting that I showed you that I'd done of my grandmother, mm -hmm. I couldn't do it anymore. I'd lost my ability to do art. It seemed like by talking it out and being so afraid to lose my job 
that I became more about things, mm. material things, how you look, how you present yourself yeah. to impress the, the people. And in doing to look that, look like an artist, or yeah, whatever yeah. That was. and in doing that, I lost my soul, mm. literally. And so one day, one day in complete depression, I was driving my car around and uh, and I talking to some homeless people, went, trying to get myself back because I felt like I was becoming like like a yuppie, you know, false person. And then I even went into a uh, into a, a how do you call it a uh, a dog shelter. Oh, an animal shelter. Animal shelter. And I pulled up a chair and I'm looking at a sad dog is in the br and I'm trying to get real again, right? So he comes up with his little gray whiskers and I'm going, I remember saying, I go, how'd you get in here, man? I mean, I was really depressed. And I drove and drove and drove my, my car up Fair Oaks Avenue, if you know Pasadena, yeah. up a dirt road and over a bridge and up a dirt road. And there was this, it turned out that it was an 80 acre ranch of a very famous artist being documented by the Smithsonian named Gerard Zortia. I was gonna say, there's a ranch, I, I think that's Lake. Is it? I think it's Lake, not Fair Oaks, but it doesn't matter. I think it's Fair Oaks. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, pretty sure, but it doesn't matter. Whatever. <laughs> so anyway, um, I go out and this little grizzly, little short guy comes out growling and grumbling like, what are you doing on my property? And, 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 and I didn't know the guy's an artist. Um, and, and I said, sir, I said, this is probably not interesting to you, but I'm having a crisis. I used to be an artist and I sold my soul trying to be somebody else and I've lost the ability to do my art. I can't believe that you actually, I mean, that you actually verbalized this. Yeah, I did. In that moment. I did. It must have been really a really bad moment. Yeah, it was very yeah. bad. And, and of course, him being a very brilliant artist and thing like that, was just kind of curious about this. And, um, and, uh, and I said, and I see, I said, but I, I've been a laborer, I've dug ditches in Tonopah at 128 degrees, you know, under a bridge, you know what I mean? And I'm a, I'm a laborer, I'm a good laborer. So, and I see you have like piles of, of things around like this. If I, I would like to ask you if I could make an exchange with you, that I could clean up an, an, an area for you in exchange that you would let me draw your animals. Yeah. So it okay. So you still don't know he's an artist. No. And just off the top of your head, you're just coming up with some a plan. Yes. Just just all of a sudden, you're just like, I'm gonna draw this guy's artist. So how am I gonna do this? I, I no money. Blah blah blah. I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can just exchange some time. Yeah. So he said, I have this friend uh, Martinez or something like that. He's been working here for thirty years. He can help you. Here's a pile of junk that took fifty years to 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 pile up or like five feet of garbage next to, if you know his house, like by his creosote pilings and things like that. And I said, I said, sir, I said, with all due respect, you, I appreciate your offering your friend to help me. I need to do this alone. And I said, and I, I don't know how else to say it, but in some way I know, I feel I need a penitence for me to become real again. I need to earn my way back to this and I, can't, I have to do it alone. And so he go, okay, have it your way. And he brought me a wheelbarrow with this great big, huge steel stakes on it. With and and he said, and, and here here's an arroyo down here. I'm filled next to the pig pens, and I, you can just empty everything right there. So for three days, from seven o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon, I filled this thing, went down the steep hill, almost falling over, dumped it over and over again until finally I was on the last dirt. And then I took a rake and I made it like a Zen garden and I cleaned out every single, every single uh, detail. And then I started going around. Finally, I earned it. Then I'm walking around drawing his chickens, you know, and up with him, you know, rawr, rawr, you know yeah, yeah. and then I'm, I'm sitting there with drawing the goats. I remember a goat grabbed a paper right out of my, right through the thing. And, and then I'm going, give me the, you know. And uh, so I went and, and uh, um, yeah. And, and later we were at a, at a gathering together and he told this story, I mean, many years later, yeah. When did you finally figure out that he was an artist? When did he share? Mm, I think, I think after that was all over, he took me into his studio and he showed me paintings. He'd, he graduated from Yale 
and uh, yeah, yeah, and he's a really, really good artist, very well, very good figurative artist. So was that was that a turning point for you then? Yes, that. I mean, it's that, almost that, like you had to burn off the depression with that that exercise and cleaning up and. Yeah, it was tennis. it was it, it was a depression, but what more importantly is it was it was, a, it was I wasn't real. And, uh, and, and I remember, uh, yeah, and I remember one time I, I was on the beach and I was, I was at, and, and the wind is blowing in, I'm, and I'm in the middle of the night and I'm, and I'm yelling in the wind and I'm going, and I'm going, why can't I, you know, get back to this and, and everything. And, and, uh, and, and I really realized and, and kind of a voice inside me said, it's because, it's because you were about things and you weren't about being real. And, and then I'm talking to myself like a madman. And, and, and I said, well, when was I real? Well, when you painted your grandmother and it was the love of your grandmother and that sincerity and you didn't know how to art, any art and you weren't doing it for money and you weren't doing it to impress anybody, you were real. And so at that time, I ended up borrowing a, Somebody's, ah, at that time, I was driving on the 110 freeway and I found a, do a junkyard dog that had been hit and he was on the side of the road. I almost got killed. I pulled off the road and he, he could have been scary, but he was half dead and had a broken back and had a sad eyes. And so, and he, a spark hit my eye and that made me slam on my brakes. I went back and got him, picked him up and put it in the car and uh, in the front seat. And uh, and gave him, went back to my apartment and got a little water to give him and and uh, and um, and then I took him. I found out the only all night um, veterinarian was in Glendale, and uh, and the guy I almost wanted to sock him because he died on, on the way, and he pulled him out. He just pulled him out and threw him in a plastic bag and and put him in a dumpster. The next three days because it wasn't my car, it was a girlfriend's car, you know, it was an old Mustang with plastic seats. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to get in big trouble, you know, I have blood and hair all over that. So I go, I, 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 I get a, a big bucket with soap and suds and water and a scrub brush and I go, God, I'm gonna be in so much trouble if I don't clean this up. And I go out there, I open the door,